Good morning. This is Richard Edelman from Chicago. I'm joined by Kirsty Graham from New York and a panel of global experts from all over the world who will come on straight after I present the data. Before I go into the uh, special report, Trust and Health, I just want to uh, say that uh, I deeply admire our clients and the broader array of companies who have actually not waited for government, but acted on their own regarding uh, Russia. The action in Ukraine, um, even over yesterday, the bombing of the hospital just signifies a state of behavior that's unacceptable and that uh, companies are prompted by their employees, by their consumers and their investors to uh, take action. And um, I just want to recognize that um, and that Edelman um, continues to uh, make donation through the uh, IRC and Save the Children and I encourage all of you on the phone to look for ways to find uh, jobs for those coming out of the Ukraine, now 2 million people. We've taken our affiliate um, into uh, work at Edelman uh, in Germany, so in our small way, trying to help. Okay, let's get to um, Trust in Health. We're today uh, actually commemorating the second anniversary of the lockdown. Um, it's been a stunning two years. and. You know, the photos on this first page, including the uh, most recent uh, action by truckers in, in uh, Ottawa, indicates the level of popular dissent and distrust of uh, science. So let's get straight to the uh, deck. Um, the first point is that uh, there have been studies of vaccination rates and what uh, Heidi Larson at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine found is that Quote, the trust chain is far more important lever of VAX acceptance than any single piece of information. That chain, scientists who create the vaccine, companies that manufacture it, health workers who inject it, and government that oversees it, is made fragile by the feeling of being disenfranchised and not heard, and that causes people to opt out. Next slide. There's also been a study in The Lancet. Um, Dr. Boyke uh, ran the uh, group of scientists, 177 countries looking at COVID outcomes. We found, they found that higher trust in government was associated with lower infection rates. Also, that there is high trust associated with high vax rates in developed countries. Specifically, that trust indicates a better outcome for COVID. Next slide. So we wanted to add to the body of work. We wanted to understand the extent to which trust determined health outcomes. We asked ourselves three questions. How does trust rank relative to other determinants of health? Second, does trust influence personal health outcomes? And third, does trust in the health ecosystem influence everyday health decisions. So let's tell you how we did this study. We went to 10 markets, which were a Canada, China, France, Germany, Japan, Mexico, Nigeria, Korea, UK, and US. We did this in the last week of February. Um, it is a national representative study based on age, region, and gender. Uh, and so here are the results. Let me give you a quick snapshot of the world as it is. Um, this is just from our January study of trust in 28 countries. This is for context. Appreciate that government and media are in a death grip. You'll remember that in fact, between disinformation and divisiveness, they have business models that actually benefit from having a cycle of disinformation and they are therefore seen as divisive. Second, next slide. You'll also remember that business and NGOs are significantly more competent and ethical than government and also media. So our thesis is business having to step into the void left by an unable government. So trust in healthcare is under pressure, assertion number one. Let's give you the proof points. Next, 
We see a decline in confidence in the health system as a result of the pandemic. That in fact, the majority believe that our health care system is not well equipped to handle the next major health crisis. Second, next. We also see a decline in confidence in ability to make informed health decisions, specifically that key word informed. I don't feel able because I don't have a shared set of facts. I can't find the answers. The decline in five years that we've measured between Jan 17 and March 22 is most profound with those in the low income category. There was more or less parity between high and low income. Now we see a 16 point delta in high and low income. Next. We also see that the source of information varies between those who are fully vaccinated and those who are unvaccinated because they choose not to be. For those who are vaccinated, the key source is my doc, recommendations of national health experts and news media, friends and family. Internet search at the bottom, number seven. Those who are unvaccinated rely most on internet search, friends and family, or they don't rely on anybody but themselves. In short, for them, trust is entirely local. Next. We also see a major concern about science being politicized, specifically used to support a specific political agenda. Interestingly, in the US, it's fairly well, even Democrats, Republicans. It's also interesting in this slide that it's more higher income and urban people, not rural, which you might have imagined. Next. We also see that the trust advantage that the health sector had during the height of the pandemic has been eroded. The biggest decline since January 2020 in Japan, the UK, and Canada. But more or less today, healthcare companies are at the same level as business in general. Compare that to tech or consumer products at much higher level. Next. We also see significant differences in trust in health, depending on your income, geography, race, and politics. Specifically, interestingly, the highest trust in the health sector is higher income people, lowest in low income people, and more or less higher among Democrats than Republicans. Next. We assert today that trust is now a key determinant of health, equivalent to socioeconomic or other. Next. Trust ranks among the top determinants of good health behaviors. If you have high trust in the health ecosystem and you trust government, you are significantly more likely to be fully vaccinated. If you have high trust in the health system, you are also more likely to get a regular checkup. Next slide. Those with lower trust in the health ecosystem are less likely to be vaccinated. Almost, it's a 38 point delta in the US. The people who have low trust in the health ecosystem aren't getting vaccinated. As white on rice, <laughs> it's just A follows B. Next. Also, those with lower trust in the health system are less likely to do regular checkups. The number in the UK is especially appalling. Only 22% of people with low trust in the health ecosystem get regular checkups. That's a recipe for disaster in the long run. Next. We find that higher trust in the system of healthcare can actually offset income disparity, quality of health issue. So specifically, the percentage of people who are fully vaccinated, if you are higher income, you are more likely to be fully vaccinated than lower income people. But if you're low income with higher trust, you have an equal chance of being fully vaccinated. Next slide. Similarly, 
if you are lower income, but you have higher trust in the system, you are almost equal likely to have gotten preventative routine checkup in the last year. Next slide. A vital statistic with higher trust, there is support for public health measures to deal with outbreaks of COVID or other over personal freedom. So for those with higher trust in the health system, nearly 60% say, I'm prepared to sacrifice for the greater good. For those with lower trust in the health system, only 40% are willing to sacrifice for the greater good, meaning they argue for personal freedom instead, even if it puts others at risk. Next. And my final slide. Higher trust gives you the mental flexibility to accommodate changing expert recommendations based on new science. So specifically, when we learn more about masks or we learn more about value of boosters, you are flexible enough if you have high trust in the system. It's a 21 point delta. For those with low trust in the health system, you can't handle changing recommendations. But that's the nature of science, you say. Well, for those with higher trust in the health system, we have much more likelihood of accepting the reality that science is evolving. Kirsty, to you. Thanks very much, Richard. So we've just talked about the impact of trust for both personal and public health outcomes. If we're going to rebuild trust and improve these outcomes, what do we have to do? So this slide we thought was particularly interesting. 65% of respondents said there was a gap between how well they take care of themselves versus how well they think they ought to. And when we asked what was the reason for that difference between how they wanted to take care of themselves and how they actually did, two reasons came out at the top. One was cost, healthy options cost too much, can't afford good health care, cannot afford treatments. But fascinatingly, information was almost on par with cost. And that, as Richard just said, was around lack of information, but changing health recommendations and contradictory expert advice. And I think it's very interesting when you look to the right-hand side and see such huge diversity of countries around the globe, that parity between cost and information. Information is almost as important as cost in the way people think about their health. In fact, if you look at the French column, information is a higher score as a barrier than cost. We also learned that only 50% of people consume health information from major news organizations or corporations or influencers defined on a weekly basis. So only one in two consumers is consuming health information regularly. Given that, who are they looking to as the spokespeople for truthful information on health issues? Well, it's split between my doctor, experts and pharmacists, friends and family. That point that Richard was making earlier around combination of expert advice and local, what is known to me. On the right hand side, you see those that are less trusted to be the spokespeople on health issues. CEOs of healthcare companies, government leaders, journalists. I just want to clarify that th this does not mean people don't have trust in their healthcare CEO. We saw that as being high in our January data. It's about the spokesperson. Who do you want speaking on the health issue? And when we look at the conduits, the sources, uh, health authorities and my employer are the most believable sources on healthcare issues. We have seen all the way through this pandemic the importance of my employer in communications. People trust their employer. They are looking to you as a source of information. National health authorities also score high, but I think if you look at the bottom, I would never believe this information if it came from this source and it was the only place I saw it. 14% of people are saying that about national health authorities. So it shows the uphill battle we have and that other actors in the healthcare system have to amplify that information, have to get it out. 
And ha the role, I think, of the employer in all of this is so critically important. Nearly eight in 10 employees expect their company to play a meaningful role in their health to make sure that I am as healthy as possible. That's a high finding, but I think what is really interesting is the reasons on the, all the specific actions on the right. Creating a healthy office environment, implementing health policies, not too surprised, but again, in this third one, we see providing health incentives and information. This continual drumbeat we hear about the importance of quality information. And I think also very interestingly, almost at 50%, offering mental health support and preventing burnout. And I think that's something that we know anecdotally has grown as we've lived in the pandemic these past two years. This is also, I think, a very interesting takeaway. To earn trust, health companies must embrace a wider, the wider determinants of health. And when we ask people about what was important to earning or keeping their trust, keeping them engaged, look at the issues that are cited. Pollution, income inequality, climate, the cost of nutritious foods, racial injustice. And what is striking here is the black column, very extremely important. This is how important people rate these issues. So to be a healthcare company, it's not going to be enough to come up with terrific products you have to be engaging in these wider determinants of health. And the other takeaway for health companies particularly is to earn trust, you've got to engage in the wider health ecosystem. Globally in our respondents, 71%, in fact, 49% that said that was extremely important to them, that you have got to be engaging in the rest of the system. And I think when we look at how government, the correlation that we see through the Lancet study and others, this correlation between the various actors in the system, healthcare companies must be seen to be working with others. This is my last slide. I think it's a very interesting one. It's talking about the bridge in that healthcare divide. And it really speaks to almost these two playbooks we see around people who have low trust in the health ecosystem and people who have higher trust. And where do they go? How do we elevate the voices that people hear? So for example, when we ask people the most convincing source for COVID information, for those with low trust in the system, it was my doctor. For those with higher trust, it was the National Health Authority. When we ask the most believable channel for health information, for those with low trust in the system, my employer. For those with higher trust, the National Health Authority. And then when we asked who was the most influential advisor for vaccine information, for those with lower trust in the wider system, my friends and family. For those with higher trust, my doctor. So you see, for those who have lower trust in the health ecosystem, we have to be able to get local. We have to be able to go direct, and we have to recognize that the old playbook is not going to work. We have to think about these responses to the health ecosystem in very different ways. With that, over to you, Richard. So um, I'll just to try and bring this together. I found it fascinating in the Boyke study in The Lancet that um, high trust in government yielded a 13% uh, increase in uh, vaccination rate, but high interpersonal trust yielded a 40% increase. And so, what I conclude from this is, this is very consistent with the Edelman finding from January that trust is local. Trust is in my employer. Trust is in things close to me. Trust is in things that I can control the relationship with. And so our first big observation is, in order to break through this barrier on information quality, we've got to elevate voices that people will hear. Specifically, where there's less trust, let's go direct, let's go local, let's use the local pastor or the doctor who, or the pharmacist. Let's not be saying it has to be Anthony Fauci. It's not going to work. For people who want to resist authority and resist expertise, go local. But for those with higher trust, absolutely rely on national health authorities and the more classic means of communicating. Second, 
this is a systemic problem. This is not simply a matter of, you know, selling the vaccine. We've got to build confidence in public health more broadly. That means the other institutions, in particular business and NGOs, have got to step up, have got to fill the void left by government that unfortunately is seen as politicizing science. And four, and on to point three, the employer's ability to influence good health outcomes relies on providing clear information as well as incentives. The employer role cannot be overstated. Last, we've got to prepare for the next big public health crisis. We have to achieve resilience. We've got to address the obvious issue of disparity in health outcomes. It's a disgrace in my country that African Americans and Hispanics had less access to, to MDs, to nurses, to others who could you know, get them vaccinated. And in particular, because they were the frontline workers, that's the biggest tragedy. And therefore the death rates were two or two and a half times higher. Uh, the preparation for the next public health crisis means that we also have to solve and end this death grip between government and media, between divisive and disinformation. We can do better. So with that, Kirsty, let's go to our distinguished panel. Thanks, thank you very much, Richard. I think some really interesting data in this study, I think some of it is around validating uh, things that we saw that The Lancet commented on and what we've probably anecdotally learned in, in the course of the pandemic. And then I think some very new and quite powerful insights. We're going to have additional data to share with you in the next few weeks around some specific sectors. But to talk about these immediate findings, um, I am joined by a great panel and I'd like to introduce them now. First of all, we have Dr. Deus Bezerra, who is the director for the Center for Global Health Practice and Impact and associate professor of medicine at Georgetown University Medical Center. Good to see you. We also have Diane Francis, a journalist, speaker, and editor at large at the National Post in Canada. Hi, Diane. Then we have Dr. David Nabarro, who probably needs no introduction to many of you, who is the special envoy for COVID at the WHO. Thank you, David, for taking the time to join us. And then we have Dean Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you, Dean Williams, for being here. If I can begin with the first question to you, Michelle, you know, when we think of those two different audiences, as, as Richard was summarizing, you know, the different playbooks, what do you think we've learned in the course of the pandemic about how do we how do we get to those who don't trust the system? How do we re-engage and learn from these findings? Yeah, thank you, Christy. And I really appreciate being a part of this esteemed panel. Before I answer your question, I want to say I couldn't agree more with the overarching conclusions from the presentation of the data. Trust clearly is a fundamental pillar of public health. Uh, trust is a key social determinant of health. It is a determinant of health. And lack of trust clearly from the presentation drives some of the health disparities that we have seen across race, ethnicity, but also income and even potentially geography. So I want to say that the first step towards a solution to this um, problem of public health um, preparedness and response for the current uh, endemic and pandemic issues that we have. COVID's just one of them. Mental health challenges, burnout are others. Um, Non-communicable diseases are other public health challenges that we face. But fundamental to all of these challenges and the way forward has to come from appreciating that evidence is going to have to drive decision-making, planning, and response to building a more coherent way to provide information to mobilize individual, community, and governance changes um, in compliance with public health. So, you know, I think the way forward has to be starting with listening and learning, which is what this exercise is about, 
but then it means taking the data and understanding that one size, one response will not work for everyone. We clearly have at least two streams of populations that are consuming their information from different sources. So a response has to be start with the awareness that we are working with a heterogeneous challenge here. Second, the information has to be pushed out broadly and widely to all of the sources that people will uh, rely on for health information. And third, there has to be ownership across all of the sectors, the employers, the, the, pri the public sector, the academicians, the faith-based communities, to all realize that they are playing a role in providing health information that should be actionable for members of their communities. And one thing that's lost is populations have to realize that recommendations around health are done at the individual level, and then there are recommendations that are, and guidelines that are formed for a population level. And so if the source of information is more specifically speaking to individual action, let's say from a healthcare provider, that might be different than the guidelines and guidance that would come from a federal health agency that's speaking to a population level guideline. And so one last thing I will say is we have to be aware of, we have to meet the consumer of this information where they are. And we have to be very clear that science evolves and as science, it's an empirical practice. So as we learn more, guidelines will change. So the information must be contextualized. And then secondly, we have to be careful in explaining what's good for the individual may not necessarily be the same guidance that's provided for an entire population. So at the core of this, communication, undergirds trust building, and we have to get better at that across all sectors. So you said many things there that I think were really, really interesting, especially that individual action, the guidelines piece. David, I, I wanted to go to you next. Do you want to comment on your reflections, given the work you've been doing the last couple of years on this, your take on, on what we need to do? Thanks very much indeed. Actually, I want to start by saying uh, how much I am enjoying this special report, Trust in Health. Right. With this pandemic, the virus is the problem and people are the solution. Uh, it really doesn't work if there are people who are being stigmatized and demonized because it is perceived by those in power that they are being unhelpful. It's really important from our perspective in the World Health Organization to embrace everybody, whatever their perspective, whatever their point of view, and to welcome them as part of the response. Secondly, uh, if, if everybody accepts that, uh, then we would also want to say that uh, if, if people are part of the solution, then they need to be embraced in the response as partners. Uh, and that means touching them and reaching them, whoever they are, and finding out why they don't feel they're partners, and then directly addressing the challenge. So, for example, in those last four points at the end of the presentation, where Richard came back after you, Kirsty, one of the things that he said was how important it's going to be that those who work in healthcare directly address the disparity in outcomes. So they directly focus on what's paining poor people. And then there is more likely to be trust. But if people don't perceive that the health service is working for them and perceive that the health service is working for others, then uh, there will be this sense of alienation that Heidi Larson talks about in her work on vaccine hesitancy and that in turn will lead to mistrust. I think it's clear to all of us, whether we're working uh, in the health sector or education or in law and order, that the degree to which people will trust 
will always depend on the degree to which they also perceive their interests are being served by a particular branch of executive authority. And so from our perspective, we would like to urge every authority everywhere to do whatever they can to ensure that all sections of society perceive that they are being served by healthcare, uh, particularly those who tend to actually perceive the opposite. Kirsty, thank you, and we'd be very happy to continue uh, either in this format or in more direct exchanges, given the absolute importance of what's being talked about here. Okay, I think that that's terrific, because I think there's some critical things in here as we think about what we've learnt this time around, and then how do we use that as an opportunity to be better and to have more resilience in the system and a smarter way of, of recognising these wider issues are so important. I'm going to go to you, Diane, and just ask, what is the role for business in this? If we say that there are system inequalities that must be addressed, we also say that nobody can do make changes in the space without working in the wider ecosystem. What is the role for business in this? Well, I think uh, business has to be on side of, of uh, getting governments to provide access to health care. Um, you know, basically, they're a business. They want more customers. Uh, let them have access to the health care system so they can get access to the meds and the treatments and the procedures that will keep them healthy. So there is a commercial value to this, uh, as well as the fact it's a moral imperative. I think what's interesting is that in the data you see, and, and I've talked about this before, United States is an outlier among uh, developed countries. Uh, it does not have a publicly supported, uh, full access healthcare system, uh, single payer system, which, which Canada and the European countries, Japan, even Mexico and uh, Australia, New Zealand do. What that means is, and I, and I take your point, the most important takeaway I thought from your report is that information is only trusted if it's locally delivered. And if you take a country like Canada or Australia or Germany, where everybody either has a, a access to a physician, a family physician, or is one degree of separation from one by virtue of relatives and friends, then you get people getting information that they can actually trust that is not politicized. And that they can that they can run with. Uh, interestingly enough, in Canada, in the first year of the pandemic, the only issue in Canada concerning vaccination was our federal government had dropped the ball and was eight months late in getting enough vaccinations, uh, enough vaccines for everybody. So people were angry that uh, the the Trudeau government in Canada did not did not have vaccines for them, and so the vaccination rate, of course, soared. So you know, you, you provide a physician. Through, and businesses can do this. Businesses can provide access to a physician through their, their facilities to their employees and their employees' families. I know they help pay for the insurance costs, but you know maybe this is a role that business should do. And uh, another thing that's important is maybe a digitalized access to a family doctor for anybody and have business take care of that and pay for that. In other words, I'd be able to dial a number, I'd be able to ask a question of a bona fide physician right then and there. Uh, they don't have your medical records, but they could they could answer questions about the safety of medicines and where people could get things. So I think that you know amplifying the local delivery is the, the role of business and that's what you folks can do best to help uh, people if they watch television now, they know it's Republican TV or Democratic TV. If they buy a newspaper, and very few do, that's also perceived to be biased. So it's they go to the social, you know, the Facebook pages, the Facebook groups, and that's where the problem starts with fraud and misleading information. So localize, get access to a physician, to everyone in the country. So, Diane, I want to come back to some of the things in Canada, but also that social media question. But before then, can I go to you, Deus, in terms of you've seen a lot of issues around health strengthening. You've also seen this piece around partnerships of all the actors in the system playing a role. When you look at that data, what is your takeaway about uh, where trust fits into that, to developing the ecosystem? Uh, thank you. Um I'll start by framing this uh, from a historical lens or perspective that 
this evidence we have seen today in this report is not isolated. It builds off a growing evidence of evidence, a body of evidence that trust has been eroding in our society, in our institutions, but also in the healthcare system. Secondly, what this also tells me is that we have to understand that trust means different things to different people and what drives it you know, across geographies, uh, demographics is also different. So whatever we think about as a solution has to be multifaceted and it's got to be complex. So here you've got two complex issues. One is trust is, you know, a complex social construct. And the other one is a healthcare system. Healthcare systems are structured differently depending on where you are. And indeed, when you look at the data points in this, in this study, but also in others, you might find a declining, you know, trust among, say, physicians in the United States, but you find that is actually going up in another country. And why is that? You know, in places like the U.S., you're going to have some historical, you know, drivers of this. You're going to have uh, race issues. Uh, you're going to have income-related issues. And there, the concern is actually more around the barriers to access. On the other hand, when you go to a country like Nigeria, which is kind of like homogeneous in terms of race, and other low- and middle-income countries, their concern will be more around quality. You know, it's more to do with, OK, I, whenever I interact with the healthcare system, I don't get good value for the, you know, for the care that I receive, whether I'm paying for it directly or indirectly. So for, for those types of situations, therefore, what you need to be looking at is how you address those concerns around quality. Uh, why do you come to a place like the United States and other developed countries? It, it's more to do with cost. And, and the challenge related to these two propositions is that we have made lots and lots of promises in the past to change the narrative. The health disparities question is not today's problem. It's not yesterday's problem. It's been there for a long time. And we've come up with proposals. We've made promises. We've made policy decisions. But unfortunately, we've not changed the outcome. So to me, this really boils down uh, to a few fundamental problems in our systems that we have to deal with. One is the failed agency relationship between the consumer and the provider. Because healthcare has always been premised on the fact that the one who makes the decisions around healthcare will be doing it in the interest of the client. Is that really still true? You know, all have other incentives set in that have led to the breakdown of that agency relationship. And so how do we restore it? You know, so if you are, say, an African-American uh, in the American healthcare system, you may want to say, based on my lived experiences, I only believe it maybe if I see the healthcare system is empathizing. You know, maybe I'm being I'm interacting with somebody who looks like me, who understands my circumstances, and will actually listen to me, you know, about these complex healthcare issues. You know, if on the, if you are somewhere in Nigeria, you know, you'll see their differences at the geographical level, urban centers versus rural areas. You know, you are most likely maybe to believe someone, you know, who has lived with you in that rural setting, understands the challenges that you are going through, so that when policies are getting made at the national federal level, they are reflective of your circumstances. So I'll end by saying that at the end of the day, whether we keep collecting new evidence or not, the question becomes what is the role of the consumer or the client first in the collection of that evidence, you know, in the measurements or the metrics that we agree to, and then what is the role of the consumer's in consuming and using that evidence, you know, because there is always this assumption in health and in public health in general that the experts know more. But actually, we found out even during this COVID-19 response, and I do a lot of work also around HIV AIDS issues around the world, when you go into a different market, you have these preconceived ideas that what you consider a priority based on the evidence is what the communities are actually interested in. 
you know, but when you actually bring them to the table and you ask them to rank what they consider important, you might find the, the issue you thought was important maybe ranks number 10. So, and unless you first deal with your top nine priorities, then that number 10 will not matter, regardless of the impact it will have on health outcomes. And so while the experts might think COVID-19 related interventions are important, there are other people who think my mental health status is more important, my economic well-being is more important. What's the point of surviving COVID and I die from poverty? And, and you know, so when you hold these kinds of conversations uh, at a family level, at a community level, you'll find what this report is, is, is telling us, it's really validating what we've all known and we see in our lived experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. So I think you make really powerful comments around the role of experts and also the role of local. And I want to ask you, Michelle, when, when you think about the scale of some of the healthcare companies or businesses in general, how do they play at a local level? How do they make that pivot? How, what does that look like? Yeah, you know, that is very important because increasingly, um, as you've seen from the results presented, um, employees and even consumers are seeing um, the, the private sector playing a very big role in, in their health and wellness. And that has to be um, an important factor that drives how employers see themselves as agents of change and partners in a public health. Uh, mission and vision. And increasingly, we're seeing this around um, actually accelerated awareness because of COVID, where increasingly employers um, began to appreciate that they had to be sure that their health and safety was attended to and done in a clear and coherent way for employees to feel safe working in the middle of a pandemic. Secondly, they started to see that they had to engage with and help amplify public health messages around social distancing, mass wearing, and vaccinations to protect not only their clients and their workforce, but collectively the, in the regions in which they operate. And thirdly, they're seeing that they have a very large role to play in how they design and maintain their physical infrastructure. They've um, understood that they have to integrate public health principles in building, maintaining, and managing their physical infrastructure. They've learned very carefully and well that the empirical quality of air in their workspace actually has improvements in the performance of their workforce and the performance of their economic bottom line, and that meaningful, sustained investments in health and safety within their workspace contributes to the overall health and wellness of their workforce, their clients, and their population. I also think that they play a very big role in engaging with governance, um, national, regional, local, global governance, of public health, as well as academic partners to educate and message. One last thing I'll say is they are important messengers of health and wellness. And they're increasingly being called on to engage with the social determinants of health. They are increasingly being called on to bring about metrics that are relevant, rigorous, and robust to indicate exactly the impact of the investments in ESG. And increasingly, as they think about strategic ESG investments, are recognizing that health is a critical component in all of these measures. I think that's a very powerful point in terms of the relationship with ESG and where some of these conversations in, in boardrooms are, are going to necessarily go. Can we go to the point around the majority of people being concerned that science is politicized? David, I want to ask you, how did we get to this and, and what do we do about it? And I'm going to come to you, Diane, because I want to, I want to hear your reflections on, on some of this as well. But David, what, how did we get here? What do we do? Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I work with the World Health Organization, 
And in the World Health Organization, there are about 7,000 scientists who spend their time trying to understand what is going on in relation to multiple disease challenges. And the one thing that we realize uh, in the work that we do is this. There's an awful lot we don't know. There are so many things about this new disease, COVID-19, that are not known. I mean, I have worked on many outbreaks and pandemics, but you know, coronavirus pandemics are super rare. And we don't know many coronaviruses that are capable of causing disease in humans. So the thing I have to say with absolute honesty to everybody is that there's a lot being discovered about this virus all the time. Now, it doesn't make me very much use to anybody if I, on television or radio, in response to questions about what's going to happen with COVID over the next year, just answer, I'm sorry, I don't know. But it's true. I don't know. I don't know when the next variant is going to come along. I don't know whether it is going to be capable of bypassing the protection from the current vaccines that we've all benefited from. I don't know whether it's going to be more severe than Omicron. I don't know. I don't know at all. And the difficulty is that if if scientists who've got access to the up-to-date information have to say, I don't know, then it, it creates a real challenge when p- policymakers are having to make decisions about what to ask people to do. So, for example, we know that mask wearing reduces risk, that if I've got the virus, I'll give it to you by accident. But we don't know how effective it is. And we also don't know how much it adds to the effectiveness of other measures. So it makes absolute sense for us to advocate continued mask wearing when there's high virus transmission. But that doesn't stop a lot of people saying that we don't know what we're talking about and saying that by asking people to wear masks, we're imposing some sort of social control. So my answer to your rather simple question is quite simply that we have been having to cope with the reality that there is much that is not known about the virus, about the pandemic, and about what it's doing to humanity. And one of the reasons why I think there's so much irritation with scientists is because we've had to admit that we don't know. And and we were talking, that's so interesting, Deb, because we were talking about this yesterday, Richard and I, and just saying, you know, that finding that particularly for people who have low trust in the system, it's deeply distressing, confusing, makes you trust less when information changes, but that is the necessity. But I think the takeaway then becomes that the communication piece is so important. But Michelle, I can see you leaning into this. Yes, um, you know, there is a particular challenge that is illustrated from the data. When people rely on information sourced from a very hyper-local setting, they are appreciating and internalizing data that will speak to just their immediate environment. But when Dr. Fauci is talking about the nation's statistics, it may conflict with what's happening in Jacksonville, Florida, versus what's happening Boston, Massachusetts, or the entire continent of North America. And so there is a structural challenge here that we have to confront with. And it, the structural challenge relates to how we help the consumers understand what generalizable data means, not only you know, the source, but what it means when we're, ta- when we're coming up with a national guideline that may look as though it's driven by data that's counter to what's happening in your community. All of this is to say is we have a complex challenge ahead of us. We have to be more intentional in meeting the consumer where they are in internalizing information gleaned from multiple sources. And the more hyper-local the source, the less 
paralyzable it's going to be if we're speaking from a national perspective or even a global perspective. So we've got to have a human-centered design in how we communicate vitally important health information for the individual rolled up all the way to the planet. And that's going to require an investment that we haven't made before. So I think that is a, a, an incredibly articulate takeaway. If we if we think about the politicization piece and we think about social media and the role, the internet and some of these other issues that we have seen uh, in the last couple of years. Diane, do you have a take on this? And I know, you know you've seen a lot of it up close in Canada, but but thoughts on that relationship? Well, I think the politicization is is um, quite disgraceful that's gone in the United States. And I think it started with President Trump, who had a daily TV series with Dr. Fauci to get himself in front of the pandemic. And that, therefore, that branding, that kind of branding and that kind of thing, uh, politicized the whole thing from the beginning. So you have the point where you have the governor of Florida selling t-shirts, don't Fauci my Florida. You know, they're, 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 they're going after, they're making him a, a scapegoat. I think all of this, the politicians are proliferating in this space to politicize it because of the structural vacuum that exists and that Americans cannot talk to a doctor directly or, you know, have access to a doctor. And so if you, if that's how you disintermediate that sort of thing from happening. And, uh, you know, where there's been controversy around the world in terms of the pandemic is, is it, it's about science in the United States very often, but in the other countries, it's about public health measures. It's about lockdowns, how it damages the economy. Why should I wear a mask? Can my kid, why can't my kid go back to school when it's nearly finished? Those kinds of things are, are valid public policy debate but they're not politicized. It, it is not a, a conspiracy uh, perpetrated by uh, some demonized politician you dislike. So it all derives from, it's not the cause. The cause is the vacuum, the vacuum of care. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, Des, when you think of your experience in this space, how do you think we build that trust back in terms of you know the points Diane's making around the various actors, some of the politicization that we've seen in a number of fields and, and across a number of geographies. What's your take on that? Uh, thank you. And I wish I had uh, a silver bullet for this. Um, but I will say, in addition to politicization, I think we've also gotten into this culture of trying to become celebrities. So scientists have become celebrities, uh, journalists are celebrities, politicians are celebrities. And what does that mean? It means we're more concerned about the headlines than really the type of information that we, 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 we share or disseminate. And so, while I, you know, I, I, I agree and strongly believe that the human-centered approach to this might bring some positive changes, I think there's going to have to be societal reckoning of how we deal with developments in technology, you know, and the fast transmission and dissemination of information and the role that plays in our spheres um, of influence and in our lives and health in this particular case um, is the subject we are discussing so if you when you have a scientist yes who's got the evidence but also is driven to want to be in front of the tv every single day um, and wants to get into debates with politicians over what they've said or haven't said i don't think it helps the cause then that, that scientist is viewed as a politician because you are engaging in a debate that is similar to political talk. So I, I think we have to rethink who these spokespeople are going to be when it comes to healthcare issues. Maybe the person who is very good at doing research in the lab is not necessarily the best person you put out, you know, as a messenger. Because we all have different strengths. Maybe we look at uh, at our teams, when we even have the evidence, who should we have around the table in passing around that information? And then most importantly, how do we democratize data science? Um, uh, you know, some of the things we try to do 
in our work, we have this concept called the data diamond. And, and, and this is based on, on the appreciation that not all of us need the, the same type of information. And therefore, understanding the different users of the, of the information and customizing what specific data points you put in their hands, including the consumers, the business leaders, the faith leaders, the healthcare professionals. Uh, and then when they engage on an issue, you've kind of tried to at least lower the information asymmetry between the different stakeholders. Because if you're having a conversation and disseminating information, and it's always the experts that understand the data that is available and are the ones passing it on, then you as someone who doesn't have trust in the system, you start asking yourself, what's my role in all this? And so you resort to going to other sources where you think you're going to be listened to. And that might be social media or that might be your friends and family. So we've got to commit to a structured data use approach that democratizes how we use data, but also recognizes that individuals, communities have a role to play in this. And we can give them data, we can put data in their hands that is most useful to them, and they speak to that. And then also for the politicians, we give them the data that they can best speak to. I think it would be a mistake to give some very complex scientific data to a politician who is a lawyer, not, I have nothing against the lawyers, to speak about that. So we really have to play off each other's strength in a way to try and, um, and deal with the mistrust that is on the rise. And I thought if I can ask just a question or a comment from David and Michelle as we close out. If you think that people say that there is a gap between how they know they should take care of themselves and how they do, and that information is a key part of it, if you had to give a sentence of advice to a business around that piece, what would you say to them around communication? Uh, I'll go first. I would say make it actionable. You have to, um, just as you want to um, democratize information data science, you also have to take down the barriers for making health first decisions. So you have to create an environment where you are enabling all people, high income, low income, um, white collar workers, blue collar workers, essential workers, de decrease the barrier that makes the decision for a health first choice to be the easiest, most affordable, most accessible choice there is. Okay, thank you very much. That's very clear. David? Thank you very much. So one can imagine that large corporations, when they want to give health information to a lot of people, think, let's do the most amazing rollout of the information using good quality communications material and getting technology to help us get into everybody's house through the media. And that's the best way to get a total, what one might call a widespread communication. But in our experience, that's actually not what is requested, particularly by people who feel at the wrong end of their health system. They would like to hear from those who can provide advice that takes account of their circumstances, that clearly adapts to their needs and is based on the reality in the local community. It's mm. not technology-based, Kirsty, it is relationship-based. Yes. So my advice to everybody if you want to be trusted, invest in relationships between providers and community at the local level through networked rollout of ideas and approaches rather than through simply doing it through technological approaches and trying to reach everybody as inexpensively as possible. You get found out is my conclusion. So, David, I think that is a really important point, and I think it's the perfect one to conclude on. I'm I'm very proud of the research that we've done here because I think it does speak to showing us just how important trust is, how we need to localise, how we need to think about different parts of our community, and how we need to be ready 
what comes next by building more resilience and saying it has to be part of a wider ecosystem on the other determinants. So can I thank you all very much for your time and for your insights, and I'll hand it back to you, Richard. So it's been two years, and I think smart people always look back and see what we could have done better. And I believe that the health sector was tied at the waist to government, in part because government was the customer. Government was spending massive amounts of money. Government had to solve the problem. The second issue was speed to market and a perhaps necessary lack of transparency on the means by which clinicals were conducted. And, you know, we rushed because we had to. We had to save people. But it left room for um, doubters. The third was we assumed that top-down was going to work because that's what's always worked, authority, pyramid of authority like this. But the world is flipped upside down. And the bottom spoke up, as we saw in Ottawa even two weeks ago. So my big idea for us to consider is how do we manage in a world of dispersion of authority? How do we make science work in a media environment in which every voice can speak up? And so my answer to this is, one, that employers have to play a new and big role because trust is inherently local in my company, in my employer. Two, that we must not rely only on traditional sources of uh, expertise and authority. Um, we have to endow those with local relationships, such as pastors and others, with the information that they can convey to their parishioners, because otherwise we're losing. We're losing the battle in the local market. We have to win at the local level. It's not going to function. The third point is we've got to solve systemic problems. We have a problem of trust in the healthcare system, and that's in part because we have racial disparity, income disparity, et cetera. And if there's anything we've learned from all of this is let's fix the macro problem in order to solve for the next big crisis. I'm deeply appreciative to my uh, trust team, Tonya Reese, Dave Bursoff, et cetera, to Kirsty, who's brought this research forward and shepherded it, and to my distinguished panelists who have made it their lives to improve other people's lives. I thank you all very much.